Well, good morning. My name is Adam. If we haven't met yet, I'm part of the team here, and it's wonderful to see you today and to see your smiling eyes. You know, I was thinking about it a little bit uh, earlier, and there's a few benefits to preaching to a a crowd with masks on. I I can't see if you're poking your tongue out at me, and I I can't see if you're yawning, so I'm just going to assume that you're all engaged, and and we're just going to have a wonderful time together this morning. You know, I hope that you were here last week. We uh, celebrated 30 years of ministry and church life on this campus. That's why we have a big 30th Uh, 30 sign on the stage there. It's not my 30th birthday. That was a few years ago. Uh, But we celebrated 30 years of ministry and we had a great day together. We looked back to the past, to our story, and we gave thanks to God for his faithfulness to us. And we also looked ahead to the future and to where we believe God is leading us. And we released this uh, little booklet called Vision, Our Prayerful Plan for the Future. If you didn't get one of these, if you weren't able to be here last week, please uh, head to the Connection Centre after the service and grab one of those and read it through. I really believe that you'll find it encouraging and exciting. And in this booklet, and last week, we shared uh, what we've called our, with you, what we've called our purpose and our priorities. Very simply, it's a renewed expression of our mission and our values. Our purpose is why we exist. It's what we want to do. It's our mission. And if you were here last week, you can remember that it's very simply this, to help more people find life in Jesus. To help more people find life in Jesus. Jesus is life. Jesus gives life. Jesus speaks life. Jesus is the only way to life. And so we want to be all about life in Jesus. Now, to accomplish this purpose, we will devote ourselves to three priorities, to three fundamental areas. Again, very simple, life in Jesus, life together, and life for others. Now, like I said last week, these are not new or novel or revolutionary. This is just biblical Christianity. These are the fundamentals of the Christian faith. Life in Jesus is our relationship to God. Life together is our relationship with one another, and life for others is our mission to the world. These are what we want to devote ourselves to. And what we did last week is we kicked off a new sermon series called The Next 30, and we're spending three weeks digging deeper into each of these priorities. Last week, we looked at life in Jesus. We saw that this is the most important priority This matters more than anything else because this is all about our relationship to God. Today, we're going to dig into life together. If life in Jesus is about our relationship to God, then life together is about our relationship to one another. It's all about the church community. It's about the people of God. Now, I'm not sure what your attitude is towards the church. I'm guessing that we have a a spectrum of attitudes in the room and and those who are watching online. Some of us, many of us, are devoted to the church. We've invested ourselves, we've given ourselves, we treasure and cherish the fellowship of God's people. Others of us, it might be more accurate to say that we are dating the church. We're around about, we check in every now and again, but we haven't really given ourselves to Jesus and to his people. Others of us perhaps have been damaged by the church. Maybe there's hurt and pain in our background that causes us to hold back from the people of God. And then there's many people, perhaps more so those outside the church, who just don't see the relevance of the church. If you were to talk with them about church, their main attitude would be, why bother? Why bother? In fact, Sam Albury is a a pastor and an author from the UK, and he's written a a little book called Why Bother with Church? Just a a, a little book, and in it, he tells about the time when he was working for a church in Oxford, in England. And he says that his morning walk to church, it would take him through a park on a Sunday morning. And he says it was a really, really nice park. Had a swimming pool and tennis courts and a pond with ducks on it and grass and park benches... And he says, on a sunny Sunday morning, this 
church, this park was packed. And Sam makes a few interesting observations. He says the park looked like a lot less effort than church. No one's going to put him on a roster at the park. He said the park looked like a lot more fun than church. He can do what he wants. He can stay for as long as he wants. He doesn't really have to make small talk with everyone. He says the park also looked a lot more normal than church. He wouldn't be considered strange for going to the park. And all of this leads Sam to conclude church is an effort. It is sometimes hard and it's far from normal. So why bother going at all? Why bother making it a priority in your week every week? Why bother getting stuck in when it means putting yourself out? After all, the park is right there, ready and waiting. And we could replace park with many other things, especially in our context, the beach, the shops, the footy, the cafe for brunch, kids' sport, our bed, especially for us 8 a.m. folk. I mean, why bother with church when there are so many other attractive options? Why devote ourselves to life together when life is already so full? This is the question that we're going to consider today. And it's an incredibly important question because if we don't have a biblical, accurate, true vision of the church. If we don't understand why the church matters, then we might as well go to the park on a Sunday morning. And so to consider this question, we're going to turn our attention to Colossians chapter 3, this passage we heard just a moment ago. Now to give you some context, Colossians is a letter in the New Testament. It was written by the Apostle Paul to a church in the ancient city of Colossae, in and around modern day Turkey. And in this letter, Paul gives an exalted picture of Christ. And he gives this exalted picture of Christ to combat some false teaching that had infiltrated the church. But he also gives an exalted picture of the church. Did you notice how he describes the church in verse 12? Let me remind you, it said, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly, Loved. This verse gives us an insight into how God thinks about the church. Now, as we've already said, to many people, the church is irrelevant, even evil. To many people, even Christians, the church is optional or unnecessary. But to God, the church is chosen, holy, and dearly loved. Now, those are some really amazing words. Imagine if Jesus himself was standing on this platform and he was addressing you this morning. Imagine if he looked around and he said to you, you are chosen, holy, and deeply loved. The God who made everything, the God who owns everything, the God who sustains everything, he has chosen you, he set you apart, and he loves you deeply. Those are amazing words. And they're not actually just random words that have been plucked from nowhere. This is actually how God spoke about his people Israel in the Old Testament. He said to the people, for example, of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 7, he said to them, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples. For you were the fewest of all peoples, but it was because the Lord loved you. You see, God chose the nation of Israel not because they were particularly wonderful or faithful, but actually because they weren't. They weren't very much to to look at. They weren't very intimidating. There weren't that many of them. But God loved them, and so he chose them, and he chose them for a purpose. He chose them for a task, to be a blessing to the world, to be a light to the nations. Do you remember what God said to Abraham? In you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. But of course, we know from the story of the Old Testament that the nation of Israel 
failed in this task. This is why the Old Testament, I don't know if you've noticed this, but it can be pretty bleak. Because the nation of Israel were not a light, they were not a blessing. They were overcome by the nations around them. And their light was dim. But of course, the Old Testament is not the end of the story. You see, the role of Israel was taken up by the true Israelite, Jesus Christ. And Jesus came and succeeded where Israel failed. He brought light and blessing and salvation to the world, to all the nations of the world. And what this means is if you place your faith in Jesus, you become part of the chosen, holy, deeply loved people of God. And so perhaps the answer to the question, why bother with church? It's because God is deeply devoted to the church. Because God has given everything for the church. Because the ordinary gathering of God's people at 8 a.m. on a Sunday morning when the wind is blowing, it is glorious in the eyes of God. And it's a glimpse into the future. This is the vision that we're given of the the future in Revelation chapter 7 at the end of the Bible. The vision at the end of the Bible is a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb, before Jesus. You see, from cover to cover, the Bible shows shows us that God is rescuing and redeeming a people for himself. That God is securing a people for his own possession and he's doing it through his son, the Lord Jesus. And this is why when we place our faith in Jesus, we don't just enter into relationship with God. We also enter into relationship with God's people. To put it simply, when God saves, he gathers. When God saves, he gathers. I mean, for the believer in Jesus, the church is not just something... Nice, but optional. The church, the gathering of God's people, is necessary and integral. You know, when you buy flat pack furniture from Ikea or something like that, you not only have a fun afternoon ahead of you, but also on that box, there'll be a label somewhere that says, Assembly Required. You know, every Christian has the same label on them. Assembly Required. I've said it to you before, Bob Dylan got it wrong. We're not rolling stones. We're rocks being built into a spiritual house. Or here's the way Romans 12 puts it, perhaps more authoritative than Bob Dylan. Romans 12 verse 5. In Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. You see, we are individuals, we're we're different, we're varied, but in Christ, we belong to one another and we belong to the same body. And this is why Sam Albury says in, in this book that I mentioned a moment ago, he says, it is impossible to be in Christ and not belong to others. A Christian, by definition, has a connection with and a responsibility to other Christians. You cannot claim Christ as Lord and avoid his people. If God is your father, then his people are your family and you are to treat your family as your father wants you to. Now that's the really important thing, isn't it? To treat the family of God as God would want us to. If the church is chosen and holy and deeply loved to God, then the way we treat the church should deeply matter to us. The way we engage with church, the way we treat the church, relate to the church, we should be deeply concerned about it because it deeply matters to God. And thankfully, we're not left in the dark about how we should engage among the people of God. The Bible gives us guidance in many places, but perhaps none better than Colossians chapter 3. This passage is a compelling vision of our life together. It tells us how we are to treat one another and what we are to do for one another. It doesn't tell us everything, but it does tell us the most important things. And I'd like to point out three of them for us this morning. Three of the things that should mark our life together as the people of God. 
First, if you're taking notes, is this. Our life together should be marked by Christ-like character. Christ-like character. The first instruction Paul gives us in Colossians 3 is this, verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Now notice the first instruction for our life together, it's actually to pay attention to ourselves. Paul says, clothe yourselves. Now this is important because often when we approach church, we approach it with the opposite mindset. We come looking at everyone else, evaluating everyone else. Do they fit in? Do they say the right thing? Do they do the right thing? And Paul says, first, pay attention to yourself. And notice specifically what he says we should pay attention to. Though he uses a clothing metaphor here, he's not primarily interested in externals. He's not mainly interested in our clothing, but rather our character. Not what we wear, but who we are. And he says that we are to put on, to clothe ourselves in compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Now, why why these virtues in particular? Well, each of these virtues are used in other places in Scripture to describe Christ. This is a snapshot of the character of Jesus. He is compassionate. He is kind, humble, gentle, and patient. And because we belong to him and we belong to his people, we are called to reflect his character. I mean, it's almost as if Paul is saying to us today, put on Christ. We are to reflect his character. This is our Sunday uniform. It's not a suit. It's not skinny jeans. It's it's not about our clothes. It's about the character of Christ. Now, compassion is very simply a soft and tender heart towards others. Kindness is practical goodness, generous behavior to others. Humility, thinking of ourselves less and thinking of others more. Gentleness, channeling our strength, our influence in a helpful way. Patience, it's having a big heart and a long fuse. And over all of these virtues, Paul says, we are to put on love. Verse 14, and over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. You know, love is like the belt that holds everything together. Without a belt, well, things have the potential to get a little bit messy. Things might fall apart, fall down, and hold a bit loosely. See, love is what holds us together, and love is what makes us stand out. And so I think this passage should force us to ask ourselves, how are we going in these areas? Are you growing in compassion? Is your heart growing softer or harder towards other people? Are you becoming more critical or less critical of other people? Are you showing kindness to others? Practical generosity? Are you doing what you can to help others? Are you growing in humility, gentleness, patience, love? This is what we are to pursue and put on. And as we do this together, we have the great privilege to show Christ to those around us, to put him on display. Because the first mark of our life together, it is Christ-like character. We have to treat one another as Christ has treated us. And this leads us to the second mark of our life together as the people of God. The first is Christ-like character. The second is peaceful relationships. Peaceful relationships. You know, if we all had this kind of character, if we all treated each other in this kind of way with compassion and kindness and so forth, you can imagine that our relationships would all be wonderful. That all be peaceful and, and, and pleasant all the time. But the reality is, it isn't always this way. I've said it to you before and I'll say it again. There is no such thing as a perfect church. 
because there is no such thing outside of Christ as a perfect person. And so we continue to tangle with our spiritual enemy, we continue to wrestle with our sinful self, and we continue to, continue to live in the midst of a broken world, which means that we are all still recovering sinners or saints under construction, which means there are going to be times when we bump up against one another, times when we offend or exasperate one another, times when we hurt or disappoint one another, misunderstand one another, say things we regret, do things we shouldn't, which means we're going to learn to have to forgive one another. That's what Paul says there in verse 13. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Now this verse is kind of funny because when Paul says bear with one another, he is literally saying put up with one another. He's recognizing that in a church community, there are going to be all different kinds of people, different politics, different backgrounds, different nationalities, different hobbies. I mean, we even have New South Wales supporters in our church. They somehow slip through the cracks of the membership process. Now, this means there are going to be times when we just have to bear with one another for the sake of Christ. But there will also be times when we need to go a step further and we need to forgive one another. When there is a grievance or there is hurt or there is offense or there is disappointment, we need to forgive. To choose to overlook the offense, the hurt, the grievance, to let it go and to refuse to get even or to become bitter. Now, why is forgiveness such a big deal? Why should forgiveness characterize our life together? The answer is obvious when we think about it, and Paul tells us in the second half of the verse. He says, forgive as the Lord forgave you. We forgive because we are forgiven people. We are meant to pass on to others what we've received from God. You know, I read this week about a, a pastor in Scotland and he, he said about a, a couple of people in his church, he said, once you've crossed them or once you've disappointed them, it's virtually impossible to have fellowship with them again. And he said something like this. He said, they will never forgive because they don't believe you have apologized to their satisfaction. Now, what a terrible thing and, and so unlike our God. You know, think about the parable of the, the prodigal son in Luke 15. When the wayward son returns home, the father doesn't put him on probation. The father runs to meet him. He doesn't even let him get a word out. He is so eager to have him back. And that's a picture of how God receives and forgives you and I. And it should move us and motivate us and compel us to do likewise for others. We forgive because we are forgiven people. And I actually think that this is one of the things that can make the church of Jesus Christ shine in our day. You know, today we're navigating what has been termed cancel culture. That if you step out of line, if you say the wrong thing, if you make a mistake, even if it was 10, 20, 30 years ago, you might find yourself cancelled, Condemned, written off, rejected. But the church of Jesus Christ should be different. The church of Jesus Christ should not have a cancel culture, but a grace culture. Because God did not cancel or condemn us for our failures. He redeemed us at great cost to himself. And he calls us to do likewise. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Now, of course, this does not mean that this is easy or simple. It's not. In fact, forgiveness might be one of the hardest things that you will ever have to do. I mean, it's often a long process. It begins with a, a one-time conscious decision, but it generally doesn't end there. It, it generally goes on in a series of ongoing decisions to forgive. 
In fact, every time you see that person, you might have to remind yourself, I have forgiven them. It's a long process, and it can often be a painful process. You know, though it does free you from bitterness and resentment, though it does enable you to move forward, it doesn't mean that the pain will magically disappear. It doesn't mean that there's not a cost. It doesn't mean that you'll magically forget what's happened. The fact is, the relationship might never again be what it was. I mean, this is why in Romans 12, verse 18, Paul says that we need to take responsibility for ourselves and for our actions. We need to do whatever we can to live at peace with others. But ultimately, we can't control what the other person does. We can't control their response. We can only control ours. And so it might be that the relationship is never fully restored. But we should do whatever we can to live at peace with others. And so we shouldn't be naive about forgiveness. It's not simple. It's not easy. It's incredibly difficult, but it's also incredibly important. It's a fundamental part of our life together. We forgive because we are forgiven people. This is the same thing that Paul says in verse 15 when he says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. Now, he's not talking about peaceful feelings. He's talking about peaceful relationships. We are to pursue peace with one another because we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Now, I wonder if God is placing a particular person on your heart. I wonder if there's a relationship, especially with another believer, that you know needs to be made right, needs to be reconciled. Maybe there's a a phone call you need to make, a coffee you need to have. Because as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Our life together should be marked by Christ-like character, peaceful relationships. And then thirdly and finally, it should be marked by word-filled lips. Word-filled lips. Here's what Paul says in verse 16. He says, let the message of of Christ, the gospel, the good news about Jesus, let it dwell among you richly. Not just show up occasionally, not just appear sporadically at special occasions or evangelistic events, but let the gospel take its root among us, make its home among us. Let it be our compass, our map, our guide. And this is why, as a church, we are committed to preaching the good news of Jesus from all the scripture. This is why one of our values as a church, you'll find it in the vision booklet, is to be gospel focused. We want the good news about Jesus to dwell richly among us. Now I guess the question is, how does that work practically? How do we see that and make sure that that happens? Paul goes on to tell us in two ways and perhaps both of them are surprising. Here's what he says. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another. Now notice Paul doesn't say, as your leaders teach and admonish you. Now that's important, that's necessary, that's what's happening right now, but listen to what he says. He says, as you teach and admonish one another. This is not just a job for pastors, this is a job for everyone. This is not just about what's said from the pulpit. This is about what's said in our conversations, in our growth groups, in our prayers. We are to let the message of Christ dwell richly among us as we talk about it with one another, apply it to one another, remind one another of it. But it's not just about our speaking. Paul says it's also about our singing. Here's what he says, that the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And so the message of Christ dwells among us richly, not just as we talk about it together, but as we sing about it together. You know, when we sing, it is more than just a warm-up for the sermon. When we sing... We're soaking our hearts and our minds in the message, the word, the truth of Christ. I mean, let me ask you this, and it's a little bit painful for me as a preacher, but do you ever leave church humming a line from the sermon? 
Probably not. Do you ever leave church humming a line from the, a song that we've sung? Probably. And so let me ask you this important question. When you are invited to stand up and sing, do you sing? Do you open your mouth and praise God? Now you might say, well, I can't sing. And I would say, join the club. And I would add, it doesn't really matter. You know, the Bible says make a joyful noise to the Lord. It doesn't say make a beautiful noise. You can be very joyful and very out of tune. Just ask me. You might say, I don't like the songs. And I would say, that's okay. We're not singing to you. We're singing to God. And Paul says we are to sing with gratitude in our hearts. You might not like the song, you might not like the, like the tune, but if you're a Christian, you can and you should be grateful. Grateful for all that God has done in Christ. And it should lead you to sing at the top of your lungs. In fact, this is what Paul says about every area of life. Look at how he finishes this passage in verse 17. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you do, do it for Jesus and do it with gratitude. Our life together should be marked by Christ-like character, all of us pursuing those things together, treating one another in that way. It should be marked by peaceful relationships. When we hurt, when we disappoint, when we misunderstand one another, we have to forgive and bear with one another. And it should be marked by word-filled lips. We should be speaking the truth about Jesus, singing the truth about Jesus, and being thankful to God for Jesus. What a beautiful and compelling picture. And I'm so grateful, it's so encouraging to see evidence of those things among us. So let me ask you, how are you going? Are you growing in these areas? Are you devoted to life together? You know, the fact is, you, you can't do these things if, if you're on the fringes. If you only show up every so often, if, if, if you show up late, leave early. I mean, to treat others with kindness and compassion and so forth, to bear with others, to forgive others, to cultivate peaceful relationships, it assumes that you will have relationships with others. To speak the word, to hear the word, to sing the word, it assumes that you'll be present when we gather. And so maybe some of us need to take a step in. Maybe this is even true for some of us joining online, and I know that there are so many valid reasons that you might be joining online, but there's also some not as valid reasons. And maybe we need to stay, take a step in to devote ourselves to life together. And you know what? It's not going to be easy. There's going to be a cost. You might have to skip going to the park or the beach or pull kids out of sport or get out of bed a little bit earlier, but you won't regret it and it will be worth it. In fact, I want to close with the story of someone from our church. Jackie King has been part of our church for many years. She leads us in worship on Sundays. She leads a growth group with her husband, Mitchell. And she's written a little bit about her experience in the latest edition of the quarterly, and I want to close with this. That's what she says. She says, it's 6 p.m. on a Monday, and I've just clicked send on my last work email. I quickly gather my belongings, offer hasty goodbyes to my colleagues, and rush out the door. My mind is already outside of the school gates when my phone buzzes and I see my husband has texted, asking what snacks we could serve for our growth group. I'm sure some of us know the feeling I'm about to describe. Maybe it's the same reason growth groups are a challenge. An involuntary wave of weariness and guilt hits me in the car park. Weariness because all I wanted in that moment was to spend my evening splayed on a couch watching the latest episode of Mindless TV. Guilt because I know better. I first joined a growth group in 2014. It was a beautiful mix of funny, intelligent, and kind young adult women. Back then, I was at uni studying a degree I didn't love and had a faith that was dormant from years of taking Jesus for granted. 
God couldn't have placed me in a better growth group at my personal crossroads. Growth group gave me a safe space to communicate my moments of heartbreak, joy, doubts in faith, and blessed assurance. My relationship with God was nurtured in those few hours once a week in the church building. What growth group offers is more than just a place to get plugged in. It will foster a rich prayer life. Ours is supported by a growth group messenger chat where members share vulnerable needs or anecdotes of gratitude. Growth group takes the initial fellowship we experience at a Sunday service and builds genuine friendships, good conversation, and rejoicing in God's goodness after confessing that we lack our own. As I stood in that car park and dug my keys out of my bag, I reminded myself that I never ever regretted the time spent on a Monday evening with my growth group, nor the friendship, friendships and familial ties I now have because of it. I replied to my husband's text with cookies and hot chockies and look forward to the warm hugs and candor that will greet me when I get home. The growth group I now attend and have the privilege of co-leading brought together different people who on the surface didn't have too much in common. But despite our diversity in ages and life stages, we are united by our desire to grow in love and likeness of our Saviour Jesus. A unity so strong because it's his ultimate love and work that binds us. It's the way God made us. My hope and prayer is that this encourages you to jump in and join a growth group if you haven't already to experience a church body with no division that honours and cares for one another. Trust me. Better yet, trust God who created you for community and more. You won't regret it. Let me pray. Father, thank you that when you save, you gather. Thank you that you do not leave us on our own, but you bring us into your family. And you call us to make a difference, to put on the character of Christ, to pursue peaceful relationships, and to revel and marvel and speak the truths of the gospel. And so Lord, for those of us who are perhaps on the fringes, I ask and pray that you might move us and compel us to take a step in, to devote ourselves to the church which has been bought by the precious blood of Jesus, to treat her with great care. And Lord, would you continue by your spirit to build us up into the body of people that you have called us and created us to be, for your glory and for the good of many more people. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand for this closing blessing before we sing together with loud voices and great gratitude. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.